In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one at this time that he was the Christ. Lord God, help us always to embrace the teachings of your church as Peter embraced your teachings. And help us also to help us also to conform our beliefs and our actions to the true teachings of the magisterium of the church. Sure. That, like Peter, we might accurately participate in the preservation of the teaching of Jesus' message, that we too may be raised to new life, and bring others to be raised to new life. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so today we're doing Papal Infallibility Part 2. Um, last week we talked about sort of the philosophical, um, sort of the philosophical argument for papal infallibility, which was basically the logical argument that uh, something can only be something insofar as it participates in what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so consequently, if you have the Pope is supposed to act infallibly, so if you ever had a Pope that so when a Pope doesn't act infallibly, that means he's not participating in what it means to be which means that he's acting as some guy, not as Pope, if he does something about it. So um, that's sort of uh, what we were trying to get at last week. So today we're going to be talking about Scripture and Tradition, Papal Infallibility Part 2, and we'll be talking about atheism next week, how to deal with atheism. So uh, I believe, uh, let's see, if you have the Essential Catholic Survival Guide, um, try to read the parts on atheism uh, next week. But the part I just read from the Gospel of Matthew is actually kind of cool because just like Protestants will often use Matthew, the thing that the Father was talking about, they'll use Matthew and they'll say, well, call no matter call no matter of Father, and then they like to see Catholics try to squirm and uh, you know, talk about, you know, how can you call a priest Father? But when you ask them about papal infallibility, and you quote this, it's fun to watch Protestants, you know, squirm and be like, oh, well, what could Jesus possibly mean by that? And the Protestant interpretation of this part of Matthew varies widely. You know, sometimes some of them will say, "Well, look, you know, he's he says, ah, oh, Simon, thank you for bringing that up." And then he turned, and then they imagine him turning to the rest of the apostles and saying, "And on this rock, all of you, I will build my church." And some of them will say, "Peter, that's it. they'll they'll interpret it as Jesus saying, "Peter, I'm really glad you brought that up." And you know. On this rock, this rock right here, you're going to build a church one day, right? <laughs> and some of them will, some of them will then interpret, will also interpret this as, you know, uh, let's see, you uh, the Christ of the Living God, be like, ah, oh, yes, you know, um, they'll point out that when Peter supposedly gave the, when, people, when Jesus and Peter had this conversation, they're in an area that has that was known for having big rock caverns, and it'll say. <laughs> They'll imagine saying, Peter, thank you for bringing that up. And on this rock, I will build my church, and my church will be as large as these caverns will. Right? So, those, so there's kind of a Protestants uh, will have, you know, they have mythology. Well, yeah, they have sort of lots of different, you know, interesting interpretations for this passage. And they don't consider the fact that Peter means rock. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, should, well, I, should, I should say that they know that Peter means rock. Um, but they, they need to come up, um, depending on your Protestant tradition, you need to have some kind of, literal. you know, some kind of literal, you know, interpretation, some kind of maybe acrobatics to get this out of, okay, well, maybe Peter, did, maybe Jesus delegates something to Peter, but it's not really just limited to Peter, you know, or it's something that's more, you know, generalized, it's not something that's like, you know, an actual power that's being passed on, and like, oh, well, you know, keys of the kingdom, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah. We'll bind on earth, bound in heaven, loose on earth, loose in heaven. Yes. I'm going to tell you, uh, 5.30 in the morning when I was driving to work, I yeah. used to listen to J. Vernon McGee. Okay. He's a noted uh, preacher. Yeah. And yeah, his, his interpretation, this went on and on and on, uh -huh. years and years. His interpretation, he said he was pointing to himself. He said, on this rock. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I will yeah, build yeah exactly. Church, I, right? I've heard some evangelicals say that Protestant right? evangelicals would be like, yes, Peter, thank you for bringing that up. And on this rock, yeah. on this rock, I'll build my church. Right here. <laughs> so it's, it's so it's kind of so it, it, it's interesting, you know. Go to different Protestant websites; they'll say like, "Oh, well, Catholics have always said it means this." Well, you know, obviously they couldn't. Jesus couldn't really have that. So, papal infallibility, scripture and tradition. Um, it's important to understand the scriptural and the traditional basis of this doctrine, precisely because um, when we think about what our faith means, um, the Old Testament indicates that you know the, God is going to send somebody who is going to reveal to humanity exactly how to be perfectly united with God. So, the Messiah was supposed to do that. If you're saying Jesus is the Messiah, what you're saying is that Jesus reveals, through his verbal teachings and also through his actions, that what the way to be perfectly united with God is. So, but, Jesus is like, lived 30-something years. He's body is no longer physically here to, you know, demonstrate to us this. So, if we're trying to preserve accurately the teachings of Jesus, there are two sources that we can refer back to. There's either scripture, which is essentially the, I mean, everything in scripture is basically something that the apostles, it's either a writing of an apostle, or it's a writing that can be traced back to an apostle. So, scripture is basically just what the apostles understood Jesus to mean. And who's going to understand Jesus better than his apostles? There was nobody closer to Jesus than his apostles. With tradition, what we're talking about is maybe things that maybe aren't written in Scripture, but things that can be traced back to the apostles. Right? So if we're trying to figure out exactly, you know, what is the revelation of how to unite oneself to God, how one is to be saved, how one is to live one's life so as to be saved, we need to consult scripture and tradition to understand uh, what the tradition or what the what the teaching about salvation actually is. So the question then becomes, well, who preserves the teachings of Jesus? Well, presumably, if we're Catholic, we'd say the Catholic Church. And the reason why an argument for that would basically be, one, well, we made scripture. And two, um, of all the churches that are around today, we're the only ones that can historically trace ourselves back to the time of the apostles themselves. Right? If you're you know, some kind of Protestant, what you're saying, you know, Protestants essentially can trace themselves back to the 1500s. Right? Um, so, you would say the church preserves the teachings of Jesus through scripture and also through the living tradition of the church. The question then becomes, who speaks for the church? Who, you know, who is the person who clarifies issues that come up, because, yes, we have, you know, the teachings of Jesus and they've been preserved in scripture and tradition, but over time, questions come up, you know? Um, how do we apply the teachings of Jesus to this situation? You know, um, huh, there's an, you know, um, we read something in scripture today that may appear on the surface to mean something different to us than somebody may have, than the gospel writer may have meant it at the time. See, there has to be some kind of clarification authority. There has to be some kind of authority that can say, no, 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 this opinion is in keeping with the tradition that Jesus revealed, that's in keeping with the teachings of Jesus, and this opinion over here is not in keeping with the teachings of Jesus. So, the church then needs to have some kind of clarification authority. Now, what happens here is that in Scripture, we see, we see early on in Scripture, that Jesus appears to have some kind of plan for what's going to happen after he dies. And what we see in tradition is that the Bishop of Rome, the successor of Peter, emerges very, very early on to be the final clarification authority. So, when we talk about our Vatican I definition of papal infallibility, does anybody remember what that was from last week? <laughs> uh, thank you, Julie. Okay. Alright, since it's a little louder to Oh, um, Pope can exercise the infallibility, infallibility of the church while clarifying issues of faith and morality. Okay, good. So, 
the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, has the ability to exercise the infallibility of the Church that Jesus Christ founded when clarifying issues of faith, which is what is to be believed about the teachings of Jesus, and then issues of morality, how one is to go about living one's life in accordance with the teachings of Jesus. So, with Scripture here, we're talking about, uh, you know, so what exactly did Jesus teach about how to determine you know, um, after he dies, what his teachings are. And he seems very... So first of all, there are many Old Testament parallels here. If you look at the Old Testament, whenever God reveals a teaching, whenever God sends a prophet or something like that, sends a message, for some reason, there, he always has some kind of central authority. Right? If you think about it, you know, we've got Moses. There's a central authority there. Moses is supposed to ensure what is part of God's revelation and what is not part of God's revelation. You've got Joshua. Joshua does this as well. You have the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The patriarchs, if you will, are central authority figures that clarify issues with regard to God's revelation. The judges. The judges do this, even in spite of themselves. You know, uh, the kings, you know, the kings are a central authority that hold the people together, that, tr that are supposed to be trying to keep the people, you know, uh, keeping the, Mos the Moses law, the law of Moses, the Mosaic covenant. So we see God sort of in the Old Testament having this track, that he has a track record of having central authority figures that can try to keep everybody keeping the covenant. And in the Old Testament, what happens to them whenever they don't have a central authority figure? Die. Okay, they get conquered. They die. You know, they become captive allies of some foreign power. You know, uh, bad stuff happens to them. So, we have God here in the Old Testament using lots of central authority figures to get people to keep the covenant, to get people to live as God has revealed through the prophets, things like that. So, God seems to think that central authority figures are pretty important. So, well, let's see what Jesus has to say about this. So, Jesus, huh, central authority figures. Well, we've got Matthew 16, which is what I just read, Matthew 16, where he talks about, you know, and you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. We've got Luke 22, which is the same thing, but in the Gospel of Luke. We've got John 21, where after Jesus is raised from the dead, um, you know, he meets, the, he meets them by the sea, and then he pulls Peter off to the side. He says, Peter, come on. And he cooks him breakfast, and he says, okay, Peter, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, no, really, do you really love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I really do. Okay, one more time. Uh, do you love me more than these? Yes, you know that I love you. I love blah, blah, blah. And, and, and Jesus says, okay, go, you go feed my sheep. Right? John does, not John does not even record him pulling John off to the side and saying that. And it's John's gospel. Right? So, you know, uh, it, Jesus in the God, so it, God, the Gospel of John does not record any other him, any other instances of him pulling other apostles off to the side and seeing to delegate authority to them. Uh, let's see, we've got, let's see, interesting here, we've got Peter's denial in each and all four of the Gospels. All four of the Gospels talk about Peter's denial. <coughs> but what did, all the, what did all the apostles do when Jesus got crucified? Right. They all ran away! <laughs> Right? Well, why not have like a particular account of every individual one of them running away? Why? Why do all four gospels talk about Peter's denial? Because he's the big one. Okay. Presumably, people want to know what did Peter do when this is going on. If Peter's such a big wig now, what did Peter do at this time? So you got the gospel writers saying like, okay, let's talk about what Peter did. Right? Okay. Uh, also, we've got the Gospel of Mark's agony in the garden. So in all, in all three of the synoptic Gospels, it has Jesus going to Agony in the Garden, he takes Peter, James, and John, he doesn't take all twelve, he takes Peter, James, and John, and says, okay, you guys sit here and pray. I'm going to go over here. Stay awake and pray. Jesus prays, comes back, you're sleeping. Get up, all right, pray again. All right, he goes back and forth, does it a couple times. In Mark's Gospel, when he comes back, so in, uh, he comes back and he, so 
I should say. In Matthew and Luke's Gospel, it says that Jesus goes back and he scolds the disciples. In Mark's Gospel, it has him saying, Peter, you let those guys fall asleep. All right, so in Mark's Gospel, he actually has, he actually differentiates, and he says, in, 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 Mark, in Matthew and Luke, he actually has him giving like a collective scolding to these three guys, the, three, the inner three, the Peter, James, and John. But in Mark's Gospel, he actually indicates that he's scolding all three of them through Peter. Peter, all three of you fell asleep. Why did you let all three of them fall asleep, essentially? So, well, so he's holding, so Mark, Mark repeatedly has him holding Peter to a higher standard than the other apostles. As a matter of fact, Mark is really funny because um, Mark actually, in the gospel, actually has, okay, okay, Mark actually goes the longest without anybody actually saying that Jesus is the Messiah. It's funny, because in Mark's Gospel, I think he does, um, Peter is the first person to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, and that's in, like, chapter 9. So they have nine chapters with, like, Jesus cleansing people, and, like, the demons are like, oh my gosh, he's the Messiah! You know, and, like, the, the, the Jesus cleansing people, and the demons are like, holy crap, it's the Messiah! You know, um, and then, you know, and for the first nine chapters, the apostles are standing around being like, oh, look at that. Oh, yeah, that got better. Jesus kind of cool. Right? But then, in the Gospel of Mark, it doesn't have any, it has the apostles. Peter is the first one, and it's much, much later in the Gospel of Mark than it is in the other Gospels. And, uh, as a matter of fact, throughout the entire Gospel of Mark, the only person that they actually recording, they actually record saying the statement that Jesus is, through Christ the Son of God, is Peter. I should say, in the, well, at the end of the Gospel, they have, like, the women at the tomb. But, let me see here, did, did the women at the tomb actually explicitly say that Jesus is the Messiah? The ascension of Jesus commissioned the disciple appears to the two, appears to Mary Magdalene. Okay, so, the only person that explicitly says in the entire Gospel of, of, uh, of Mark, uh, no, it's Peter, and he's got the Roman centurion saying it. And that's about it. Yes, Mary Magdalene's at the tomb. Jesus does appear to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene never explicitly says, Oh my gosh, you're the Messiah. Right? He does appear to her. doesn't have her say that. Peter is the only, Peter and the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross are the only people in the Gospel of Mark that explicitly say, explicitly recognize Jesus as the coming Messiah. <coughs> so that's kind of interesting. Also, Peter is the only, Peter is the only apostle that is in all of the resurrection accounts. All four of the Gospels have different combinations of people in the Resurrection accounts. Peter is the only one that is in all four of the Resurrection accounts. <coughs> so there's something about Peter, you know, Peter knowing something about Jesus' resurrection that very few other people kind of get. You know, in John's Gospel, it's like Peter and John. In Luke, it's Peter and somebody else in the walk to Emmaus. In Mark's Gospel, it's like the women, and then he appears to the two, and one of the two is Peter. And then he's got, um, I think in Matthew's Gospel, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, he's got uh, it's the report of the guard, and then it's, you know, Peter as well. So, in, in, it's Peter and the women. So the, the women see him first in Matthew, and then I think they go to Peter. But Peter is in all is in all of the resurrection accounts. Okay. Um, also, Paul's letters, right? Um, one thing that's kind of interesting here is that the Protestant Bible, Protestant evangelicals are normally mentioned. Well, you know, how infallible could Peter be? Paul rebukes in the letter to the Galatians. Um, Paul says, you know, I don't agree with this one thing that Peter did. Um, but what's interesting there is that in several of Paul's letters, Paul actually um, refers. He actually one of the justifications that he uses for why, how the people that he's writing to can know that his teaching is true is that he was instructed by Peter. Yes? I was just thinking about the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, that Peter yep. is frequently imprisoned. Oh, yeah. uh, of all the apostles, he's the one that gets imprisoned. 
So even the, the, the Hebrews at that time saw some authority in him. They wanted yeah. to get rid of the authority. Yeah. No, what's interesting here is that in Acts, if you go through Acts 1 to 5, right? Peter, you see very early on in Acts 1 to 5, Peter is the one doing stuff. So Peter is the one that this, Peter is the one that takes the lead in deciding that Mattathias is going to replace Judas. And then who's the first person that give, who's the person that gives the first public homily about people being risen from the dead? It's Peter. Peter quoting the line from Joel about how the Spirit has come within them, the uh, prophet Joel. And then Peter is the first one to baptize people, and Peter is the first one to catechize. And then you've got Peter actually excommunicating two people for like not Ananias and Sapphira, not Ananias and Sapphira for saying they're going to sell their property and hold everything in common, and then happening it's for themselves. Peter then says, I know what you did, and Book of Acts says that they drop dead as soon as Peter, you know, uh, says, I know what you did, and excommunicates them. Um, let's see. Also in Acts, in, in, see, in Acts, in Acts 1 to 5, what else? You know, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, right, Peter is repeatedly imprisoned, and every time Peter is brought before the Jewish council, in Luke's account of Acts of the Apostles, he actually goes out of his way to make to, act, to make it basically be the Gospel of Luke, Passion of Christ, take out Jesus, and insert Peter. It's the, in, in, in the Greek and in the Latin, it's very, very, like the grammatical structure is almost exactly similar. Peter's trials are almost exactly similar to Jesus' trials. So Luke is going out of his way there to try to show that Peter is the one that's sort of keeping the tradition the most, because they're going and getting Peter and John, for the most part. The Council of Jerusalem, right? Paul comes back and he tries to say, okay, the, 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 you know, we want the Gentiles to become Christians. And everyone's debating it, and then once Peter sides with Paul, everyone's like, oh, well, if Peter's with Paul, then okay. So Peter sort of makes the make-or-break decision at the Council of Jerusalem in the Book of Acts as well. <clears throat> so um, this is, you know, and again, we have Paul at numerous points in his letters referring to being instructed by Peter as part of his, you know, justification for why he's teaching what he's teaching. So we see, let me have this again, Paul's reliance on Peter. Okay. Um, various Protestant objections to, the, to this here. Uh, See, so first of all, Protestants will object by saying there's no scriptural basis for papal infallibility. Okay. Um, well. <laughs> no, that's another one where they want the word. Yeah. So then we say, okay, um, all right. So fine. So if you so if you bring these up, you know, you can often get Protestants say, okay, fine. There, maybe there's some kind of you know Jesus favoring Peter, but you know that's not really papal infallibility. Okay. So they'll object that there's no Petrine primacy. And then if you say, okay, well, normally the Protestant objection will be, okay, fine, uh, Petrine primacy, seems to be a lot of Petrine primacy going on there. Um, one way I've heard, uh, actually there was a Protestant evangelical that I talked to about this, and she actually said that um, what, she, what she had always heard was that Jesus singled out Peter so much precisely because Peter needed the training and was the most bumbling of the apostles, and as a result, this shows Jesus' mercy and patience for even the dumbest of people. And, and, There's some truth in this. Yeah, so, well, well, the funny thing is, is uh, I then I then said, well, that's very interesting, because, um, you know, uh, you're saying Peter needs the training. <laughs> yeah. He needs the personal instruction for what? You know, uh, what's, what's the... You know, fine, Peter needs the personal instruction. Well, maybe that's because Jesus knows he's going to do something in the future that he needs the personal instruction for. And that would explain why Jesus goes to so much trouble throughout the Gospels to, you know, make sure that he's pulling Peter off to the side and telling Peter stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? The Gospels don't often refer to him pulling Thaddeus off to the side, being a Thaddeus. <laughs> right. Um, Thaddeus, make sure these guys don't fall asleep. You know, um... So they'll object to that. They'll, they'll, they'll also object to that to the idea that there's like a hierarchy. But if you look at the Gospels, what you get often are uh, disciple, right? Jesus has like disciples who are not part of his inner twelve, 
and then you've got the 12, and then you've got the 3, and then you've got Peter, and then you've got Jesus. So it's, there's, so there's certainly some kind of hierarchy that we can see here in the Gospels. All right, um, they'll often object to the idea, Protestants will often, also often ob object to the idea that, uh, they'll say that Scripture actually contradicts papal infallibility because in the letter to the Galatians, Peter actually tells the Galatians, look, um, you know, I, I have rebuked Peter for this particular incident. But I'll see this. Galatians. Let's see what the Galatians actually says here. Galatians, Galatians. Oh, yes, here we go. So, letter of the Galatians, in, let's see, chapter 2, verses 11 to 21, he talks about how when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For there were certain men that came from James, and he ate with the Gentiles. And he came back and drew, and he, uh, when, they, when the Jews came, when the people from James came, he came and drew, drew himself back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And with him, the rest of the Jews acted insincerely, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their insincerity. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves, who are Jews by birth, are not Gentile sinners. And you know that man is justified not by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, so what is Paul rebuking Peter for in Galatians? For not acting, for not acting the way he's supposed to be, right? He's eating with Gentile Christians. Christians who have converted from Judaism come in. And Peter leaves the Gentiles and goes to the to the to the and spends his time with the Jewish Christians. So notice, notice here, Paul's problem with Peter isn't that he gave a bad teaching, right? It's he's, yeah, he's saying that Peter didn't keep proper etiquette. Peter Peter was you know not maybe you know he's leaving he's leaving one kid's lunch table to go to the cool kid's lunch table, mm -hmm. right? But he doesn't have a problem with Peter's teachings. As a matter of fact, in the same letter that Paul rebukes Peter, you turn to chapter 1, he says, Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, and I remained there for fifteen days where, where I saw none of the other apostles except James the brother. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, that's how he knows that what he teaches is true. So, the very chapter before he talks about how he rebuked Peter for this etiquette violation, he talks about the reason why he knows what he teaches is true is because he was instructed by Peter, and he saw nobody else the whole time that he was being instructed by Peter, except James. So, and that's him explaining, you know, how he, in the previous section before that, that's when he's talking about how there's no other gospel. There's no other gospel except that which I have preached to you. And where did I get my information? From Peter. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Um, so those are the typical Protestant objections you'll hear to papal and Bellby not being in Scripture. You know, they'll say, you know, Peter, you know, Peter, or Paul, you know, rebukes Peter himself. They'll say, well, you know, it's, it's a generalized thing. He's not singling out Peter. You know, they'll, they'll, or they'll say something like, oh, fine, you know, maybe he is singling out Peter, but there's a good reason why he's singling out Peter that has nothing to do with plans for what will happen after, after Jesus' death. Um, so, if you look at the old, so, I mean, uh, you know, it's a pretty, pretty convincing scriptural case you can make. Can you um, yes. also Go ahead. interpret it as, um, as Jesus says, I didn't come here for the well? Yeah. That's... Peter ministering to those who are not well. Yeah. In the same, same. Yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. Let's see. So, um, never talk about the tradition how it's developed. So we see in the in the scripture here, Jesus appears to have a plan for what's going to happen after he dies, and it's in keeping with Old Testament parallels. Because whenever again God sends a prophet or reveals something in the Old Testament. He has a central authority figure that is able to, that's supposed to be able to keep people keeping the covenant, 
and then they're going to, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, try to accurately preserve the teachings of Jesus, or teachings, teachings that God has given them through the prophets. So when we get to tradition here, first thing we need to understand is how Christianity spreads. Basically, what would normally happen is you have an apostle, right? Apostle goes to an area. Apostle goes and teaches in an area. Um, how did apostles normally instruct people when they went to go teach in an area? Verbally. Okay, verbally. So they, when they were verbally instructing them, what kinds of things would they teach them? They were telling them the stories of what happened when Jesus was alive. Okay, so they tell them stories about Jesus' actions. They tell them about the verbal teachings of Jesus. What else would they teach them with? Well, their own behavior. The way they act, behave. They would also teach them rituals. They would teach them rituals that were designed to help them remind themselves of what being a Christian was supposed to be like. So they would teach them these rituals that would, you know, um, teach them by actions. For example, you know, like, we, 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 teach, we teach about the Last Supper, so, you know, there's, so, we must, so it's really important to do this, you know, uh, Eucharistic thing. And the presence of God is here when you do the Eucharistic, when you do the Eucharistic thing, you know. Um, when you come into the church, you must pour this water on yourself to cleanse yourself of your previous life. You know, and we know from previous sort, we know from like other sources of the period that you know uh, the reason why they did that was to simulate drowning. That you had like drowned to your old life, and now you're rising up, and it's as though you're living again. So they would teach them the, these rituals, which uh, it's not kind of like sacraments. So. They do verbal, so the apostle teaches verbal teachings, and he also teaches actions, and he also teaches them the rituals. When the apostle can no longer stay there, or you know, you know, feels that his job is done, he would move on to another place. But first, he would appoint what was called an episkopos. That's where we get our word bishop from, episkopos. And the job of the episkopos seems to be to have to preserve the traditions that the apostle had taught the community. And we see this, we can see this in the letters of Paul, because Paul writes several letters to episcopuses. Um, and then we also know this from, from the tradition, from, from you know, uh, other documents we have outside of Scripture. And then the apostle would move on, and the episcopos would then be in charge. And the episcopos would then be trying to preserve the tradition. Now, if the episcopos had an issue that he didn't think he could clarify for himself, he would write letters to people, trying to get clarifications on things. When the apostles were still alive, who would they write to? The apostles. They'd write to apostles. For example, that's, how you, that's why Paul writes so many letters. Right? John writes letters. James writes letters. Jude writes letters. Peter writes letters. Right? The episcopos is like, oh man, I, the I need, I need, there's an issue for clarification. Let's write to an apostle. Now, what ended up happening is that if you couldn't get an apostle on the phone, so to speak, you would, the episcopos in one location would then send a letter to another episcopos that perhaps had an apostle in their community. And they would say, okay, well, what did this, did this epis, did that apostle say anything to you about this? What's the tradition that you guys got from this apostle so that we can apply it here? Now, generally speaking, um, apostles, so episcoposes, so let's say, you know, the apostles go on, apostles over here somewhere. He writes a letter to this episcopos over here, who had an apostle. Now, very quickly, a hierarchy of what episcopos were more authoritative developed based on which apostle you had teaching your community and how long your, the apostle taught in your community. Now, the issue is that the episcopos of Rome became very sought after to clarify decisions even within the first century, because the two biggest figures in the apostolic period were Peter and Paul. Both of them had taught in Rome, and both of them had taught in Rome for a while. Which means that very early on, you start to get lots of episcopuses from other smaller areas, like, you know, Corinth, which only had Paul, and for a shorter amount of time than Rome had Paul, and then Rome also had Peter and Paul teaching at the same time for a while. So, episcopuses then started to write letters to Rome to clarify issues of dispute. So, if you could get, 
a hold of the Episcopos of Rome, you would then be able to, the idea was that the Episcopos of Rome was more authoritative, probably had more information because they had the two most important teachers in early Christianity there, and they had them there for the longest period of time. So this is sort of what develops. And it develops, you know, while the apostles are actually still alive and kicking. So what kinds of things can we see in the tradition here? The first letter we have, the first document we have addressing this issue, I'm sorry, how am I doing on time? I don't have my phone or my watch on. Quarter of eleven. Quarter of Quarter of eleven. Okay. I just want to make sure I get through enough of the tradition before I open it up to, like, questions. So, um, the first document we have here is the letter of Pope Clement the I in 96 AD. Now, Pope Clement is the fourth Episcopos of Rome. And then he writes a letter in 96 AD that survives today. You can actually, if you want to see the document in English, you can actually go to newadvent.org and they have the entire letter translated into English on their website. Um, and basically the issue here is that the Corinthians wrote Pope Clement I a letter asking him to clarify something that St. Paul had said. And the issue was that the Corinthians so this is 96, so Paul had been in Corinth in the 50s, so this is 40 years roughly after Paul had founded the community. They write a letter saying, you know, Pope, uh, not saying, uh, that's it, say, I know, but this boss Clement of Rome, you know, please, you know, uh, we've decided that we didn't like our Episcopos and our Presbyteroi. Um, and we've deposed them and elected ones that we like better. Um, can you please uh, approve this? And the letter that Pope Clement replies back with is, no, I'm not going to approve the people that you have elected for yourselves. Um, and the reason for this is that everybody knows that the office of a priest or a bishop is only legitimate if they can trace their office back to an apostle. So we've got Pope Clement the first, and he says, and he says, since the people you deposed could trace their offices back to St. Paul, Give it up. And so we got Pope Clement I here saying that the, the principle of apostolic succession, and when he addresses the letter, he, he actually says, it's, he, uses, he basically says, he says, it is, he doesn't say everybody knows, but, he's, but what, he, what he's getting at is that, uh, I think the phrase he uses is, you know, um, as has always been the case, or something like that. As has always been the case, um, Episcoposes and Presbyteroi, their offices don't depend on what the people think about them. Their offices depend on them being able to claim that they have kept the tradition dating back to the apostles. So what's a presbyteroi? Um, the Episcopos won't buy an apostle. If the Episcopos, if the area got too big for the Episcopos to handle by himself, he would appoint one of two types of people, or possibly both to help him. He would appoint Presbyteroi, and he would appoint diaconi. And these are where we get our words priest and deacon from. So, notice here, it's not like, yeah, so, well, like, Presbyterians look at the original Greek and they'll be like, well, look, Presbyteroi, he's appointing Presbyterians. No, no I don't think so. Um, presbyteroi, it's a Greek word that comes into ink, the word, we get our word priest in English, from, let's see, <laughs> from French, which came through Latin, which came through Greek. So, Presbyteroi Greek goes through Latin, into French, into Old English, into Contemporary English as priest. Um, How do you spell it? Uh, Presby, P-R-E-S-B-Y-T-E-R-O-I. Okay. Episcopos, right? Oh, Episcopos. Episcopos. Yeah. Episcopos. Yeah. Like Episcopal, but right. take off the O-L as O-S. Right. And so notice here, it's like a downward expansion. The Apostle appoints an Episcopos. If the Episcopos can handle everything by himself, he does that. If he can't, he appoints Presbyteroi. The purpose of Presbyteroi were to see to the people's spiritual needs. The Presbyteroi would do the like sacramental stuff that an Episcopos couldn't get to for logistical reasons. And the diaconi would take care of the physical needs of the people if the episcopos couldn't do it himself. 
Yes. So if, if an Episcopal um, died un suddenly, unexpectedly, yes. yeah. would the nearest Episcopal come and appoint somebody else? Well, um, d it depended on the area, from what our knowledge is. What, what would normally happen is, what would appear to normally happen is the Presbyteroi would then, I should say, I mean, if, if they had Presbyteroi, they didn't have it. If they had Presbyteroi, the Presbyteroi would get together and decide who the next Episcopos would be, and then they would ask three, they have to get three other legitimate bishops to come, and Episcoposes to come, and approve that the Presbyteroi had many bishops. And Rome was highly sought after. As a matter of fact, there were some churches where they said, if you could get the Episcopos of Rome, you didn't need anybody else. Okay, so Pope Clement I, 9680. And then we have St. Ignatius of Antioch. We saw him when we talked about what? What? Deity. Deity. No, he he was the, the, um, the guy who really formulated uh, the Trinity. Well, let me talk about the Inquisition. Inquisition. No. no. St. Ignatius of Antioch, real presence of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. The early writings. Yeah. The, the yeah. early writings of yeah. the church. They say the early doctrines. Yeah. St. Ignatius of Antioch writes a letter to the Romans, because after all, in 107, the Romans have arrested the third bishop of Antioch, St. Ignatius of Antioch, and they're taking him via land route to Rome for public trial to be fed the life. And he writes several letters to churches on his, on his way. And he writes a letter to the Roman church saying, please don't, you know, stop this from happening. I'm willing to die for my faith, blah, blah, blah. And, but one of the, but when he writes to the Roman church, he says two things to the Roman. He says one, you know, first of all, don't stop it. Second of all, um, he talk. He talk. He says that he says that you know, Roman Church, you know, he says that all their churches, you know, judge their orthodoxy based on what you teach. And Ignatius of Antioch is actually the first person to use in any of his letters the terms, or he uses the term Catholic Church. It's the first uh, first document, it's the earliest document we have where the term Catholic Church is used. And it's Ignatius of Antioch who says that the, he says the head of the Catholic Church is the Bishop of Rome. And the question is, what did head mean in 107 AD? Right? So, Ignatius of Antioch actually uses the term Bishop of Rome and head of Catholic Church in his letters. 107 AD. Okay, um, let's see. Some of this stuff is more important than other stuff. Um, let's see. Now, one of St. Ignatius' students, who was a bishop of Smyrna, St. Polycarp. St. Polycarp, around the year 160 AD. Um, there's actually this big d dispute between the Greek-speaking Christians and the Latin-speaking Christians, where uh, in Rome, they celebrate... What's it? What's it? In Rome, they celebrated they celebrated Easter um, on the same day at, no on the same day as Passover, I think at the time. And then in the Greek world, they never celebrate the same time as Passover. And there was a dispute as to when the right time to celebrate Easter was. And Polycarp, from Smyrna, Bishop of Smyrna, goes to Rome to try to iron out this dispute. Well, why would he go to Rome if Rome was just some other bishop? Some kind of there's something there in Rome that would make him go to Rome to talk with the Bishop of Rome. Um, in 150 AD, heretics actually appeal to Rome to judge the Bishop of Rome to judge whether or not they're heretics. There were some early heresies. Um, I think it was the the Marcion heresy and possibly also the Ebian heresy. <coughs> a couple of early Gnostic heresies where. Local bishops had condemned these guys as heresy, as heretics, and they were like, oh, we don't trust you because you have, like, personal grudges against us because you're here in the local locality. We're going to appeal to the Bishop of Rome, and the Bishop of Rome will decide because, you know, the Bishop of Rome would know since Peter and Paul were there. And they appealed to the Bishop of Rome, and the Bishop of Rome is like, yes, all Gnostics are heretics. Let's see. St. Irenaeus... of Lyon, who was a student of Polycarp, who was a student of Ignatius. So, apostolic succession. 
he writes around the year, what was his time? He's writing in the one, 170s, 180s. And St. Irenaeus of Lyon actually writes in his writings that the Bishop of Rome is the head of the Catholic Church, and we know this because the Bishop of Rome is the only bishop that can trace himself all the way back to the Apostles, and then he gives us a list of the, at the time, 12 bishops of Rome from Ignatius, from Irenaeus' time, back to Peter himself. And he says, as a result, because Rome is the only bishopric, you know, Rome is the only bishop that can, has historical documents that can, like, you know, tradition that can actually trace it back to the Apostles, and no other bishop has that in his, the same degree that the Bishop of Rome has, the Bishop of Rome should be, like, the definitive arbiter of what is Christian and what is not Christian. Year 190 A.D. This is the first um, term, this is the first time the word excommunication is used in documents. It's used by Pope Victor to excommunicate some Greek bishops over the Easter question. Year 200 A.D. Tertullian, famous church father, uh, was a lawyer at the time, um, Roman, writing in North Africa. So notice here, we've got Rome, Antioch, Smyrna, middle of Turkey, Irenaeus of Lyon, France, Victor in Rome, Tertullian, North Africa. So pretty sizable geographical region that we're covering here. Fairly, you know, you might say a universal region. Right, it's not like you've got everyone in this region is saying stuff. It's sort of spread all throughout. Tertullian actually uses the term. He says, quote, everybody knows that Rome produces and regulates the doctrine of the church. 280. Tertullian. Running out of room. Okay. 250. St. Cyprian of Carthage writes that, quote, Rome is indeed the final case of appeals to clarify issues because the Bishop of Rome succeeds Peter and Paul. So, St. Cyprian sort of says that the Bishop of Rome is the supreme court for theological issues. There can no higher authority than that. The Emperor Decius, who launched the third major persecution of Christians, was quoted as saying, he would rather see a rival to the throne than the election of another Bishop of Rome. And he actually, Emperor Decius actually, uh, when he began his persecution, the first person he executed was the Bishop of Rome. So, even the people who were trying to persecute the church were like, the, if we're trying to persecute the church, we can't really persecute the church if we're not always persecuting the Bishop of Rome. So, we see Domitian did the same thing in the late in the, in the late 90s AD. Nero did the same thing in the 60s AD. So the first three major official Roman imperial persecutions, all the first one of the first victims is Bishop of Rome. They all target Bishop of Rome. Yes. I'm just curious. Uh, we now have the cardinals elected the Bishop of Rome. Yes. But back way back then, did they appoint somebody that would follow them? No. no. Well, I, I should say it. it Documents are sketchy because you're being persecuted. There aren't a lot of documents <laughs> to write. You know, you can't leave a big paper trail. So what we appear, what appears to be the case is that wouldn't it, it be it's, just it's like you said, all yeah. the bishops, yeah, if they passed, mm -hmm. all their priests that were their helpers yes. gathered mm -hmm. together yeah. and said, "You got it." Yep. The next guy, and you could look at the priest as the cardinals. Yeah. So so essentially, like. Literally, right, the word cardinal comes into use in the 8th century, and the word cardinal originally just meant that you were a, mem you were a member of the Roman Church. You were directly under the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome. So, it, yeah, so, yes. Yes? What I've been able to read is that a, a open election has happened ever since. I mean, you know, after Peter. It has always been... Because obviously the previous pope ain't going to uh, yeah. approve or or nominate the next pope, so it's yeah. been 
whoever the, the bishops are have gotten together and done an election. Yeah. It's, it's the only surviving democracy kind of deal that's, that's ever been in the world. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there is certainly, there is certainly, as far back as we have records, there is the record of some people who have determined, who have been predetermined by previous popes to have been qualified enough to cast a vote. Right. Do select the Bishop of Rome, as far back as we have records. There is a voting process, of course. The previous bishops of Rome determine who is qualified to cast a vote for the previous, for the subsequent pope. Absolutely. Let's see, so that was St. Cyprian and Decius. Um, 325. The papal representative, Bishop Osius of Cordoba from Spain, um, presides over the Council of Nicaea. He's the one that gavels the meeting, and he presides over the meeting. The Pope's personal representative of the Council of Nicaea. Let's see, in 355, when the, Ar the Arians tried to, when the Arian heresy tried to get off the ground, they tried to lobby Pope Liberius in 355. Well, they, and then they tried to get the Roman government to lobby Pope Liberius to accept the Arian heresy. 382, Pope Damasus commissions the first Bible. So, Sola Scriptura people. There was a church for 382 years before there was a Bible. An official Bible. And the books that are in the Bible were selected by Pope Damasus the first. And approved by other bishops. Okay, um, let's see. Let's see, 390, St. Ambrose excommunicates the Emperor Theodosius for executing his political opponents. Emperor Theodosius appeals to the Bishop of Rome over St. Ambrose, who was the Archbishop of Milan, and the Pope upholds St. Ambrose's excommunication of the Emperor Theodosius. Uh, let's see. At the Council of Carthage, uh, regarding the Pelagians, St. Augustine was arguing against the Pelagians and waiting for the bishops to make up their mind on whether the Pelagian heresy was a heresy. St. Augustine then appealed to Rome and said, we can't make our decision until we hear from the Bishop of Rome. Everyone at the Council of Carthage says, of course we can't make our decision until we hear what the Bishop of Rome has to say. Bishop of Rome sends a letter back, and the, the uh, Council Fathers of the Council of Carthage said, quote, in the proceedings of the Council of Carthage, Rome's reply has come, the case is now closed. 431, the Council of Ephesus condemns the Nestorian heresy. And they say that the reason why they have the authority to condemn the heresy is because the Bishop of Rome had already condemned it. Let's see, 451, Pope Leo I condemns monophysitism. And the Council of Chalcedon says, we condemn monoph 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 monophysitism because Pope Leo I condemned monophysitism. We hold to his explanation for why it's condemned. Fourth Council of Constantinople in, eight, in 869 to 870. Okay, so this is where we kind of get good here. Uh, this is where we get explicit definitions of the papal papal. Uh, see, so we've got Fourth Constantinople, 869 to 870. Fourth Constantinople. So this is one of the last, one of the last, actually councils that both the Greek church and the Latin church agree existed and was legitimate. Fourth Constantinople says, Orthodoxy is found inviolate in the Roman see, and all other sees must judge their orthodoxy relative to the teachings of the Bishop of Rome. That is the last council that the Greek Orthodox church accepts as a legitimate council. And that's what they that's, that was in their proceedings. Fourth Constantinople, 869-870. Council of Lyon, 1274, was asked to be a little bit more specific than Fourth Constantinople was. Council of Lyon in France, so this is Council of Lyon in 1274. These guys say, quote, when asked to determine and more specifically define the Pope's authority in 4th Constantinople, we find that the Holy and Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff hold primacy over the entire world, 
and that the whole Roman pontiff himself is the successor of blessed Peter, prince of the apostles, then the true vicar of Christ, and the head of the whole church, the father and the teacher of all Christians, and that to him is, in blessed Peter, the full power of feeding, ruling, and governing the universal church that was given by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ while he lived. That's pretty to the point. Yeah, I, I would say that that's, you know, pretty, you know, you know elaborate. Okay, so then... <coughs> People then, you know, in 438, I'm sorry, 1438, asked, the Council of Florence was asked to decide whether or not the Council of Lyon's decision was legitimate, and they approved everything that happened at the Council of Lyon. So that's the Council of Florence. And after the Council of Florence, the next church count, the next time this was addressed was at Vatican I. And Vatican I gave the definition that we talked about last week. And Vatican I has been upheld by Vatican II and previous popes and subsequent popes. So that's, that's where we get the tradition from. You can see that we can very clearly trace the tradition of papal, that the pope having the final clarification authority on the teachings of the church, we can trace from today to Vatican I, to the Council of Florence, to Council of Lyon, to Fourth Constantinople, and then all the way back to Pope Clement I, who seems to think he has a clarification authority. And then we can trace that back to what Jesus seems to want to happen after he dies in the Gospels. And then on top of that, we have the nifty philosophical argument that we talked about last week. So we can safely say here that if you believe Jesus is the Messiah, you'd kind of have to eventually arrive at the definition that a papal infallibility that Vatican I comes up with. I know I talked more at this class than in subsequent and previous classes, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, we were able to put the scripture and the tradition together in the same class. So at this point, I'll take any questions. How, how am I doing on time? You're doing great. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Ten after, okay, so I've got five minutes of class time left to take questions, plus any questions you want to go, um, anytime you want to go at her. So, question, any, any questions, any issues? And so, okay. well, well, if, yes? Um, you don't really talk about this, but I'm wondering when the term Pope became... Oh, good, because that was in my notes. I skipped it. Okay, uh, the term Pope came into usage... Pope Damasus was the first Pope to be called Pope. He was called Pope because he commissioned the first Bible. Who was this? Pope Damasus I. What year was that? That was 382. 382 AD, the first Bishop of Rome to use the term Pope. Well, I was just thinking that the term Pope was used in, in Latin long before yeah. any, any Christian association with it. Yeah. But it meant like father or something like yeah. that. Yeah, the idea was that the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, was the father, more or less the chief father of the church, mm -hmm. as Father Ray was talking about Mass today. Right, the, the term term father as it was used in yeah. common lingo. And yeah. so, it, maybe in writing it wasn't used, but probably it was used long before that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So if we were going to do apologetics on this, if someone brings up papal infallibility, um, how, what, what are some apologetic tactics that we might be able, what are some things that we could say if someone says, ah, papal infallibility, you Catholics. <laughs> or if Catholics say papal infallibility, you Catholics. <laughs> what, are, what, are, what, are some things, what are some things that we could maybe say to try to defend this particular doctrine? Well, yes. this, this may sound small to some people, I guess, but I've been thinking the a while that you talk about like, Moses, uh, Peter, mm -hmm. and uh, Joshua. Mm -hmm. uh, in the military, we have a chain of command. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a chain of command, you and no discipline, uh -huh. there's chaos. Yeah. I think along those lines, that, okay. you know, it would, because you know, you, you can't you can't talk to somebody on the street and consider that he has a knowledge that you do. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I kind of okay. you know kind of got to get it down on my terms. Chain of command. Okay, so you're saying, so, you're saying, so, uh, so, so you can say, well, how can you know if the teachings of Jesus, how do you know if your church has the teachings of Jesus unless you've got the chain of command that you can trace back to his closest followers? 
in the Catholic Church. You can say anything about the Catholic Church. We can at least say we can at least trace our stuff back to the time of the apostles itself. Themselves. The, yes. To me, the overriding issue has got to be how do you preserve mm -hmm. the teachings after death? That, mm -hmm. that seems to me to be the central yeah. issue. Yeah. And. Yeah, well, I say one of the things we can say here with the tradition is that if you look through the tradition, nothing that a pope or a legitimate church council has taught has contradicted a previous teaching of a pope or legitimate church council, and at no, no point has a pope or legitimate church council issued a teaching in their official capacity that would that would certainly violate any of the teachings that Jesus had given to his first apostles either by scripture or via tradition. Because if you look at, if you, we can trace tradition back, we can say, okay, it's, very, it's fairly clear that first century Christians had the following sets of rituals, the following beliefs. We can look at scripture and see what they say in scripture. So we can think of the Bible as kind of like the owner's manual, the scripture and the, and the tradition is sort of the owner's manual for what's going on. And subsequent popes and church councils, what they have to do is clarify issues or apply the teachings that are in tradition or scripture to new circumstances in a way that preserves the original teaching. So we can say, that, well, never at any point has that been contradicted. There are three instances where many people would, there are three instances that people argue the opposite in church history. I can go into those if you'd like. But suffice it to say that if I, bring, if, if I do talk about them, I would be making the case for why they don't really contradict uh, the tradition of the church, even though some people argue they do. Yes? I was going to say the, the parish, for, uh, because of my geography, uh, the parish in Hyattsville, mm -hmm. that just converted from Episcopalian yeah. to Catholicism, one of their statements was that they needed the authority, mm -hmm. definitive authority of, of, yeah. of the church because... Yeah, no, one of the big issues the Episcopal, a, one of the issues, big Episcopal, one of the big issues the Episcopal Church is having is that they say that the final authority is, say, a church council. But the problem with the church council thing is that so the Episcopal Church would accept church councils up until the Reformation, and then they would also then say we have well, we've had our own council since then. But the problem is that there's no central authority. What they're running into is that their doctrines have been changed in the Episcopal Church since the 1950s. By hand, by hand votes, right? If you can get enough, if you can get enough sympathetic people to show up to your council, you can get your view ramrodded through, regardless of whether or not it is actually in keeping with the teaching of the the tradition of the teachings of Jesus or not. So, that's, that's, so I know with, with a lot of Episcopalians, that's a lot of Episcopalians now are looking more at the Catholic Church for that reason, um, because things change via hand votes. Um, in the Episcopal Church. Follow Unfortunately. Journey home. What? Follow Journey Home or the EWTM. Yeah. Okay, so what are some other apologetics things that we might be able to say? What What are other ways that we might be able to, to defend the Church's teaching on this? I would say yeah. one of the big things that I see is it seems like the Catholic Church is a central figure mm -hmm. for the entire world. Whereas if you look at a lot of the um, other religions, mm -hmm. they have regional central figures. Uh, yeah. And nothing refers to, okay, you got a bunch group here, you got a bunch group there, yeah, that, that's our... So are you the world Lutheran church? Mm -hmm. The world Protestant church? No, no, no. We're just, you know, yeah. the Midwest Lutheran church, yeah. which doesn't really follow in line with the East Coast Lutheran yeah. church. There's nothing going mm -hmm. central. It goes up to a certain level and stops. Yeah. One of the, and, and the funny thing here is that, right, one of Jesus' teachings is that his <laughs> church is universal. His, his teachings will be universal. They will span the entire world. Right? Um, so that's, cer that's, certainly, that's certainly a good point to bring up. Uh, I'm going to bring up something that's esoteric. Sure. Uh, even Hollywood recognizes the Catholic Church mm -hmm. as being the church. Because if you ever watch a movie where they were going to have a... Um, uh, a Christian element in it, or there's, uh, they're going into a church, it's always a Catholic church. They don't go to Protestant churches or to halls. They go into a Catholic church with the statues and, the, yeah. and everything. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of 
dichotomy that they show. Yeah. Um, but well, I, was, I, I think I want to that, speak, sorry, I was, I was going to piggyback off that for a second, but okay, continue. But the the thing is, with when you're talking with an evangelicist, you have to be on the scriptures. Oh yeah. 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 You know, you just keep going back to the scriptures and saying it, whether they believe it or not. Yeah, no, yeah. If you're if you're talking to a Protestant evangelical about this, you do not want to say, "Well, look, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon." <laughs> right. What you want to do, what you want to do is refer them back to Old Testament parallels. You want to talk about the meaning of particular words and passages in scripture. I want to go up on. What's interesting here is that uh, Osama bin Laden in 1993, I believe wrote an open letter to the American people that was not to the American people, but rather um, trying to garner support for his, at the time, fledgling al-Qaeda resistance cell in the Middle East. And one of the arguments that he gave for this is that Christianity is inherently corrupt. And his rationale for this was, look at the head of Christianity, the Pope, you know, lives in Vatican City, and blah, blah, blah. So Osama bin Laden, <laughs> Osama bin Laden recognizes the Pope as the head of Christianity. Um, I mean, he obviously doesn't understand Christianity very well, but even people that... I use Osama bin Laden as a safe man for voting it. No, no, I'm saying, like, if even Osama bin Laden can, you know, come across, can, like, somehow trip across what, what's true, then, you know, so, 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 I guess, so I guess if you, if, I guess if you had someone that you could be tongue-in-cheek with, you could say, like, well, look, you know... And based on that, based on that as a universal church... Yeah. And I know we're going towards the politics here. Mm -hmm. Virtually every country in the world recognizes Vatican City as yeah. its own country, yeah. and the head of Vatican City of that country mm -hmm. being the Pope. Yeah. You don't see that with the Lutheran Church yeah. that the countries, mm -hmm. other countries, whatever Malaysia mm -hmm. looks as the Lutheran Church. So mm -hmm. there has to be something yeah. there. Yeah. So, uh, the, 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 I mean, diplomatically, most countries certainly recognize that there's something different about the Vatican. In order to have diplomatic relations with the Vatican, you have to acknowledge via concordat that that the territory that belongs to the Catholic Church in your country is contiguous to the Vatican City State, and as a result, it's territorially different from other churches. In order to have diplomatic relations with the Vatican City. So. For example, when President Reagan established diplomatic relations for the first time ever with Vatican City with Pope John Paul II, how do you do? Um, Jerry Falwell at Liberty University then applied to have an embassy sent to him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, as a way of, since he was a big supporter of President Reagan, he wanted to make a point to President Reagan that, you know, by even having diplomatic relations with Pope John Paul II and sending an official ambassador over there, um, he was tacitly acknowledging that the Catholic Church is more important than Protestantism. Yeah, I have other stories I can say about that. <laughs> we'll say those for later. Any other any other questions? Yes. I was, was going to say uh, one of the things that that uh, I think is most interesting. Come to one, come to first uh, talking about. Yeah. You have to stick with the apostolic succession yeah. in order to be legitimate. Yeah. And and that that's pretty strong. I think. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting here. 96, so Clement the First is writing before the Apostle John is dead. Right, the other Apostle had been martyred by this time, but the Apostle John, he dies somewhere between the year 98 and 102. The Episcopal Apostle of Rome writes this letter saying apostolic succession before, while apostles are still alive. <laughs> right, so he could have gotten a clarification, I mean, for all we know, he could have written a letter to the Apostle John that doesn't survive and, like, you know, got some clarification on this. You know, uh, again, in John's Gospel, John's Gospel himself, John finishes John's Gospel by saying, and the beloved, the beloved Apostle is the one writing this, blah, 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 the one who is from source of this information, blah, blah, blah. But right before he says that, he talks about how Peter's the head of the church. John spends more time talking about Peter than about himself. Um, but yeah, yeah, Clement the first year, 96 AD, he says, church authorities are not the what makes you a legitimate church authority is not whether the people want you to be there. In this case, because the Corinthians like, you know, didn't like what Paul Paul's people had told. Probably for the same reasons that, you know, Paul wrote letters there. You know, yeah, all the time. So they had deposed those people, and Clement, Clement says, well, everyone knows that the legitimacy of your office depends on how well you're preserving the apostolic tradition. And those guys 
were appointed by guys who were appointed by guys who were appointed by St. Paul. And they can trace it back. Yes? I was going to say, you might also want to bring up the fact that Jesus never committed anything to writing, so uh -huh. if he were worried about his teachings being uh -huh. misconstrued, you know, he would have written it down instead of placing the authority on the person, he would have put it in a piece of paper. Possibly. But, I mean, that's, that's a good argument, Ms. Depperschmidt. Um, but then that gets down to, like, why Jesus didn't write anything. And Aquinas takes up that question. And Aquinas takes up that question. All right. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, I was just going to uh, say maybe we should consider uh, the, the apostles and, and people that were crucified and boiled in oil and did all of that for the church. Yeah. Uh, what other religion has done that? I mean, you know, it's to me that makes it a lot more legitimate. Yeah. No. Uh, I mean, you know, the fact that somebody gives their life, what, what more can you give? Yeah. No, there were there was actually uh, the Roman historian that was was I think it was Dio Cassius actually actually wrote that. Christianity spread in exact proportion to the amount of blood that was on the Colosseum. Making the point that Christianity spread precisely because people were so willing to die for their faith that people were saying, those people are willing to die for something. They established credibility. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's established credibility very early on. Whereas if you look at, say, I mean, some, some Catholic historians have pointed this out, that, for example, you look at the rise of Islam, right? Islam, spread, Islam didn't spread anywhere that Muslim armies hadn't gone, right? Whereas Christianity spread everywhere it did in spite of the fact that it didn't have an army to carry. That's true. So, which one would be more in keeping with a sacrificial god? A religion that spreads because people are willing to die for it, or a religion that spreads because people are willing to kill for it? So... Okay, so next week we're going to be talking about um, major complaints that atheists have. Um, in particular, we'll, we'll sort of, I'll address the big four, and then I'll try to address uh, other other concerns as they may come up. But next week, um, have to talk with atheists. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good week, everybody. Enjoy your Sunday. Okay. Just a quick <laughs>